Hey, Jackass, where's my DoorDash? I don't know. DoorDash had a problem. As their cloud-native environment scaled and developers delivered new features, their monitoring system did what monitoring systems do and kept breaking down. In an organization where data is used to make better decisions about technology and about the business, losing observability means the entire company loses their competitive edge. With Chronosphere, DoorDash is no longer losing visibility into their application suite. What's the key? Chronosphere is an open source, compatible, scalable, and reliable observability solution that gives the observability lead at DoorDash business confidence and peace of mind. To learn more, read the full success story at snark.cloud slash chronosphere success. I've been beating Azure up a fair bit lately, which they absolutely deserve. And this is no big surprise to anyone who's even slightly familiar with my nonsense. A friend of mine recently mentioned something over drinks that she thinks of Azure as the boomer cloud, at which point I spat my own drink out and immediately knew what I had to do, build something on Google Cloud Functions. So off to the Google Cloud console, I go. I think of Google Cloud Functions more or less as AWS Lambda with Google branding, because AWS does have the first mover advantage in cloud. That's my baseline starting point. Now, unlike AWS, which hurls you into a morass of options that assume you know what you're doing, the wizard that Google Cloud offers is pretty straightforward. It starts by asking whether I want to use the first generation or the second generation function options. Now, a quick perusal of the differences between those two showed me what I basically expected from Google. Generation one is deprecated and generation two is in beta. Given I'm historically a sysadmin, I bias for old and busted over new hotness, so generation one it is. Next, it asked me what to call it, and I'm doing that myself because I'm not fool enough to delegate naming anything to a cloud provider just because they're so terrible at it. It then asked me what region to put it in, which I absolutely don't care about in the slightest, so I just accept the defaults on the theory that something that's currently on fire probably won't be selected. I might be giving them too much credit. The next thing it cares about is what invokes the function. What's the triggering event? And I was met with eight potential options, four of which were marked preview in the dropdown menu. At this point, all I want is a function that's gonna automatically fire off every five minutes or so and none of the options presented to me seem to do that. A bit of Googling shows that Google took a page from AWS on this one. The right approach is to set up a job in Google Cloud Scheduler to fire off every five minutes. It'll then toss a message onto a Google PubSub queue, which can be consumed as a cloud function trigger. How straightforward. I gotta admit I cringed at this. AWS has taught me that whenever you have to cross service team boundaries like this, the experience is absolutely going to suck for you. I was therefore thrilled to learn that apparently Google doesn't have stringent internal policies that prevent one service team from talking to another service team every once in a while. And setting all this up just took me a few clicks in the console. For the rest of setting the function up, I accepted the defaults and moved on to the, and now what do you want to do for code? I had to select a dropdown of which language I wanted to use, and I was met by an absolutely sarcastic number of options. I went with Python 3.10, and it auto-populated the in-browser text section with a skeleton function, which was really nice. At this point, my infrastructure is basically set. All that remains for me to do is write some crappy Python to make all this do anything useful. Two weeks later. Well, that didn't take me very long to bang out because what I want is relatively simple. Whenever Microsoft Azure's Twitter account tweets something that isn't a retweet or is a reply, and we know it's insipid, I want the function to trigger my bot to quote tweet their tweet in all caps along with the kind of commentary that you would generally expect to come from what appears to be Azure's target market, baby boomers. I had to walk to build a cloud in the snow when I was your age. I stored 
The Twitter API credentials in the Google Cloud Functions environment variable section, but then I was faced with a problem. Once this horrible bot has tweeted about an Azure tweet, I don't want it to do it again. Move on to the next tweet. Where do I store the single piece of state that changes for this entire application, the ID of the last tweet that it saw? This is a deceptively complex problem in cloud, and none of the providers have a differentiated answer for this. Every option I explored required at least one of two things, either setting up a whole means of accessing something that's in a different subsystem just to retrieve a 20-digit string, and or have to store API credentials for a third-party service to hold all that data itself. One horrible idea that occurred to me was to just use a second Twitter account as a database and simply just have it tweet out the last ID of the tweet that it processed, because I do already have the Tweepy Python libraries for working with the Twitter API integrated into this thing. I dismiss this idea because it's nearly as deranged as using Route 53 as a database. And who would do something like that? I opted instead to use Google's Cloud Firestore option. Now, Cloud Firestore came out of Firebase, but Google renames and turns things off, so now Firestore it is. It's a NoSQL document database that does an awful lot of stuff I could not possibly care less about, but it also will take a key and return a value, and that's all that I want. Now, the shining jewel of the experience here is that because both Firestore and my Google Cloud function are in the same Google Cloud project, by default, the security permissions meant that it just worked without me having to strike a deal with the devil to get it secure or not letting me do anything at all. I wasn't expecting this and I am enchanted by that entire aspect of the experience. The unsolved problem as of this video remains that I haven't gotten Google Cloud repositories to properly sync from my GitHub repository correctly. So I'm reduced to copying and pasting code in like some kind of monster from 1998. But all things considered, this was a delightful development experience that I'd absolutely recommend to someone who's starting out. And if you care about what Azure is doing, which you absolutely should not, you should keep up with the antics of my Cloud Boomer Twitter bot account, which, if you've gotten this far with my nonsense, is no doubt going to tickle your fancy.